Hello and welcome to the GAK.co.uk Guitar Shop Podcast. I am your host, Mark Packham. Who is with me this evening? Hello, my name's Matt and I'm the manager in store. Hello, I'm Joe and I'm here for bass-related queries. Now, you may notice that we're down one J Cross this evening. One very loud. One very loud, squawky J Cross. Um, Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome to 2014. Yeah, it's a a new year. Coming to you from the real, actual future. Yeah, that's a fact. Did you love the future. The future's brilliant. It's great. We're talking to people on the internet. I don't know. Who would have have thought? Um, How were your Christmases and or New Year's? What did you get up to? They were good. My New Year's was good. I drank a litre of rum. Nice. And oh. I've got really obsessed with um, with extended range bases, extreme <laughs> extended range bases. <laughs> Is that a consequence of drinking a litre of rum? I think it. I think so. I, th- I can. It's the only comparison I can. Extended draw. range bases made to look like bottles of Lamb's rum. Oh yeah, <laughs> but it's I'm really into Lamb's rum. That was a really good New Year's. Did what you ever see you? that base that the um, bass player from Van Halen had that was in the shape of a Jack Daniels? Yeah, yeah. He's had lots of stuff, hasn't he? What's his name? Stig. Michael something. Anthony. Oh, oh, Michael, oh, Michael Anthony. You're thinking of Stig yes. Peterson. I'm thinking yeah, of Stig Peterson. The guy that had right. the, uh, the upright olive bass, which was just a stick with a string, right. but then the body was He's a He's also got olive. a jazz bass where the headstock is the body of a jazz bass, and yes. the body is the headstock of a yeah. jazz bass. And Ridiculous. he has one that's like a, a rocket, and the fretboard is inside. Yeah, yeah the so rocket so just yeah. looks like you're playing Holding a rocket. rocket. Yeah. Did you get anything guitar-themed for Christmas? Um, what did I get? Oh, I bought, uh, I bought a CS3. Oh yeah, I didn't really get that, um, f- uh, but yeah, b- I bought a CS3 because the time has come for me to return my Whirlwind Red Box that I was borrowing off of Matt. Yeah, it's a great compressor, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm I'm trying to buy more Boss products at the moment. I think we we talked about this on the walk over here. Is that last year was like such a good year for Boss, just in terms of how we think about them. Yeah, oh, I was very happy to receive a. Cr- uh, a um, Christmas card from the uh, the president of Boss How did you addressed get to me. Card? I was like, "That's amazing." Was it on eggshell card? It's uh, it's no, but it's got a picture of a duck on it. Oh, that's good. That would do. That's close so enough. You've been spending your Christmas money on Boss CS threes. Yeah, I bought a Boss CS three. Why'd you go for that one? Um, because I I needed a, a new compressor. Lots of people use them. I think the compression that I'm after is very very simple. Um, but also, I tell you what, I've I've actually had enough of um, really simple compression, like the 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 Wait, Whirlwind Red Box. You no, said no, no, I know. Well, 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 simply controlled, uh, simple sounding, and simply controlled um, are two separate <laughs> okay. things. Okay. So what you mean is you want something that doesn't change the tone that much, but you want yes. to be able to do it. You want to have a bit of control over it. Exactly. You, so you want That's tons exactly of controls right. that you don't touch. Yeah. <laughs> which is give you really good well, compression. You, you know, some things that as a lot of compressors have a um, more effect on the voicing of your instrument than others, and uh, and things like. Uh, I find a lot of those things like the Whirlwind Red Box, they're really great, but only having those those two controls, only having sort of the the output and the sensitivity mm. on there, mean that. You know, there's only certainly on a bass. There's only so much I can do, and I think bass compression maybe needs to be a little more complex than that. Also, I really don't like all the kind of, you know, the sort of 52 controlled like the the, the Mark bass and MXR both do bass compressors that I just have a bit too much gump on them for me. So it's, you want something in in between? In between, and the CS CS3 is is that it's just a very simple, obvious, basic compression sound. But you know, I've got four controls on there. I've got threshold, which is quite important, and you know I can just mess around with it a little bit more to to get a more specific tone. I suppose it's funny, really. I, I spent a little bit of time over Christmas, um, just what you sound about compressors, like just reading about effects and like the history of effects. I've got a couple of books that are like kind of about it. And it just must have been so weird because I was reading about um, Keith Richards when he used like a Gibson Maestro fuzz box for oh, yeah. can't get any satisfaction. You just thought. Like now, there's tons of effects that you can go out there and buy, and like loads of multi effects. But imagine just being like, "Wow, a fuzz pedal!" Just yeah. like a pedal in general, just being like, "Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, something plug else. my guitar into this." Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a, but like compression for me, my, I don't know. Sounds like the weirdest effect yeah. you could have gone out and bought because you'd been like, "I don't know what this does." I don't really know what it. It's not. It's not necessarily particularly obvious straight away, and I suppose you would have really only known if the effect if you were working in studios or recording. Yeah. So for it to then come out in a in a box that you can be but like, it's, it's so essential for bass players these days. Yeah, I think um, much more so than guitarists because it just it's, you know especially if your finger style, 
that it, it just evens out everything across your playing and you know so many times i i i see shows with uh with bass players who are maybe only just starting to gig and if they're finger style and they don't have a compressor i'm hearing sort of every fourth or fifth note as it sort of peaks wildly above mm -hmm. where the guitars are sitting that's uh, ironic that that has become a thing as headroom has grown in amps so the louder amps have got actually kind of the less you'll be hearing because if you had something that's a bit underpowered it's yeah. kind of naturally compressing it's like picking up well, all, exactly. the... all the mids are gonna sort of punch through aren't they yeah when you've got less headroom Matt Knight, what did you do for Christmas? And did you get anything guitar related? I did, although it hasn't. I, I, I have got it, but it actually turned up today at my girlfriend's work, so I will get it when I get home. What is um, it? And is it's it? um, something that Korg have done in collaboration with a company called Little Bits in uh, in America, which they make um, little modular electronic kits um, for all ages. Um, but it's all like magnetically clipped together, so you can kind of build all these sort of like massive circuits and, and whatnot and do all these. It's it kind of like Meccano for the, the modern age, effectively, but everything's electronic controlled and the, everything just clips together and you can do all these crazy circuits. Korg have then gone, well, why don't we do something and we'll build basically a monotron but we'll disassemble the monotron, give you each individual part, then you can magnetically then clip together in different sequences to make different synthesizers. That's no, really so, awesome. Um, Does it have any? What's the control input on it? There's no keyboard or anything. Yeah, like that. there is. There's a mini keyboard that's what? literally what? about so, five centimeters oh, long. So the it's same got a full thing that you get keyboard. on all the, on yeah, the little pretty much. But it's not a ribbon controller. It's actually like little notes. Oh right, it was an oscillator. It, it comes with twelve modules to start with. You get like an oscillator, a keyboard, uh, two oscillators actually, a keyboard, a delay unit. Nice. Like everything, and it all just clips together mag magnetically so you can just feed an oscillator straight into a mini speaker that it comes with and you'll just get a pitch control but then you can send that through a keyboard and then you can send that into a delay and then you can split the signal into something else so it's it's yeah it's quite cool because then you can kind of mix it with that other things awesome. and there'll be other stuff coming out so I think it'd be quite a cool neat thing for recording that's really cool we're going to be doing those right the little bits uh, hopefully yeah I think so I spoke to Korg and they like they've done like an initial pre-order run which is one of the ones I've gotten and they're doing some more after that oh, amazing what about you um, I didn't get anything for Christmas um, guitar related but oh, I did no, I treat myself yes, did. just before Christmas um, the best time to treat yourself well yeah I mean you, you know you're walking around it was literally on the day when you and I were walking around doing shopping for our respective girlfriends yeah um, and I sort of came in here and went oh that's quite a nice thing, Ray, at quite a nice price. Um, and so for the first time in t probably about 10 years, I bought myself a bass other than my P bass that I play. That is and you are day. the biggest P bass advocate. Yeah, 100%. And my P bass is in a bit of a state of disrepair at the moment just because I use it all the time and have used it all the time. And don't look after it. And it needs, it definitely needs some work. Um, so over Christmas, all I've been doing is sitting on the sofa playing with this Stingray and I've I've never really spent that much time with the Stingray before. I just kind of saw it and thought, well, that's, you know, cheap enough that I can have a mess around with. Um, and it's really good. It's really it's good. One, is it have one of the older American ones? Yeah, it's, a yeah. it's 94. How are so, you finding active circuitry? Um, do you know what? I plugged it in in the shop, and I have not plugged it in since, since because ah. um, at the moment, where the Christmas tree is in my house, uh, that's where I would need that, to move the sofa back to to get to my bass amp. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, um, is it all boost on those? It's two band EQ. It's two band EQ. It's all boost. So it's two band EQ. It's, an, it's only ball rather than just the, um, you know, the kind of uh, just the music man yeah. stuff so it's after the only ball buyout um, but it's still got the old star bridge with the string mutes mm -hmm. and sweet have, oh, have you used those yet I, know I you haven't plugged it in I but have, still with I have but awesome. to be honest I do loads of muting just with my hand oh, yeah, so the they've got string mutes for yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, the early ones I think it, up until about the mid 90s really uh, no, right, not like it? the um, not like the old Gretchy ones or the, the yeah like little, yeah, little pads like them, yeah. really yeah, yeah that's right. right you can get string mutes on a bass that has a pickup in the most trebly position you can possibly <laughs> yeah. put it and it's a humbucker and they kind of to they be honest they kind of don't work um, you, you yeah. wind them up to the string and they touch it and they push it a bit but because it's so like fendery and you know like high tension and um, mm. it doesn't really make a difference but I do a lot of muting <laughs> with my hand anyway but put um, some flats on it. No, it doesn't really. It's not going that far, Joe. Come on, <laughs> um, baby steps here. It's the first bass in twelve years. Yeah. Baby steps. <laughs> so, um, it's yeah. It's just got an active treble and bass boost, 
on there um, and a volume control. Have uh, what, what strings are on it? Because I, I remember on your P bass, you'd recently moved on to something like fifty to one twenty. These are the same set, fifty to one twenty. Fifty to one twenty. Yeah. Jesus. And they feel great on the Stingray because it's so snappy and so like yeah, yeah. aggressive. I bet the tension is super high on those. Uh, yeah, it is indeed super high tension, and uh, it's playing like a dream. And again, it goes to show like if you've got a guitar that hasn't been set up for a while or hasn't been looked after you play something new and you kind of go oh mine feels really bad it's and it's not that you've got a bad guitar no. it's that you need to I, maintain your I, instruments I tell you what in terms of guitar maintenance it, it's one of the funniest things you, for me to see, see so much second hand stuff and then you kind of like you know something comes in and it's really dirty and the strings haven't been changed for ages and someone's just not used it you know like say for example you bought a new bass and then you go oh, I just, I'll leave the old one and then you sort of forget about it and yeah. you might buy some other things you always know it's there but you sort of you sort of like the sandwich maker on your top of your kitchen cupboard <laughs> they are that <laughs> um, and until you actually like just take the strings off clean the fretboard I think like cleaning the frets and the fretboards like the, one of the best things you can do 100% put a new set of strings on you're like oh yeah this Definitely. guitar's like aged well I've been putting it away and it's amazing how much difference it makes people do, and you don't realise until you do it well we were talking earlier I'm working on a piece for the uh, the GAK blog at the moment um, a, and I think it's going to be called oh, yeah. Top 5 oh, Reasons Your Guitar Sounds Terrible yeah. um, and it's just going to be things like that it's you know a lot of the time it's not to do with the pickups it's not to do with the amp that you're using it's that you haven't changed the strings for but, 6 months but every time every time I change strings on my bass I'm probably not every time but I'm certainly checking and I tweak my truss rod a lot yeah. and I think that's something that people use certainly you don't even touch yours well, that's why your P bass is the, again it needs to go in for so much work yeah. and the the reason I haven't done it on mine is that I've got a repro scratch plate with oh, where it doesn't uh, have it the cut doesn't out. have the cut to get to the truss rod yeah um, well that's it on my 50s P bass it's got a 50 style neck so I have to unbolt it from the body to do it really yeah, yeah. Wow, it's quite a scary thing is you experience. can with, with that, especially with the guitar. Sometimes what you can do is you can slacken all the strings and then capo the first fret. Yeah, and then you can you take don't the necessarily off have to change that, all the strings. That is what I do. I'll yeah, whip them off. I was hoping that every time you did that, you just put a whole brand new set on. It's costing you thousands of pounds in strings a month because it. But then you know there was because I remember like years ago, like watching some rig rundowns, reading about some certain like certain artists and like. You always think guitar techs, yeah, they change the strings every night, and you know some of the like big bands that are like stadium tours and they might use three or four guitars yeah they change strings like but some bands i think i remember actually reading about mars volta and uh, he was saying that he basically never changed his guitar strings omar rodriguez yeah. well he uses flats now yeah. because just uh he wants you know, that so he always has that dead tone yeah yeah but it's, it's it's amazing really i mean you know you get some people in here and it's, oh, it's been a while since i bought some strings and you know it's been like a year mm. and and you think oh, i've just changed the one but actually you don't realize it's until best. you say you put that one on it depends what you want, doesn't it? I suppose I like I was dealing with a guy um, over the phone who was buying a load of strings from us, and it was um, he was buying some uh, Elixir, uh, some of the steel bass strings, mm. but he wanted to buy like five or six packs, mm. um, which is quite a lot of money when because they, they're like thirty pounds a pack, yeah, yeah. and and steels are really really bright anyway, and. Uh, and he was saying that yeah he kills a set of strings in well, half I mean, an hour on yeah. set and I was like well, you must he must need such a trebly tone to yeah. do that yeah but it's not even that some people just don't get on with the feel of strings after they've played them for a, a couple of gigs you know yeah, it's, it's, it's funny really because <clears throat> you know it, it does vary I think like the level of acidity I suppose it is in people's fingers you know people do wear through strings oh, some quicker. people just destroy them straight I mean away. I, I don't change my strings I should change my strings more often but is it, is my, it monthly my, for my, yeah, my strings don't really ever rust and I've, I think in my whole guitar playing life I don't, I've snapped probably about two strings mm -hmm. but strings never rust for me when I change the strings they feel so much nicer and so much brighter but the other strings aren't like covered in gunk or like yeah. really blackened but yeah it's, you, you take off some and you're just like man yeah, put some new strings on that but you, you forget even like I say someone like me who doesn't corrode strings as quickly how much difference a new set yeah. makes I mean I've been playing I've had flats or on my bass now for coming up for three months and they still look and feel it exactly as they did mm. when they went on and they're still you know still completely clean and like, it's, it's the best thing about about flat rounds I suppose if you don't need that that sort of mm. bright top end tone they just seem to not age as much at all yeah at all at I, don't all, know, I don't know when I'm going to need to change no, these they no. still well, look and sound great I mean um 
I was talking to Graham, our tech, and he was doing a setup on a, oh, what was it? It was like a 64, 65, like, P base or something like that. And in, mm-hmm. in, 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 I think in Shell Pink, the guy had had it refinished in the 70s. And he'd bought it. He was the second owner, and he'd bought it in, like, 73. And, yeah, he put a set of strings on it, a set of flat round strings, and never changed them. Yeah. He'd still had the same strings in, like, That's 1973. Amazing. And he was like, yeah, whatever you do, don't cut the strings I want to make sure the same strings stay on there oh that'd be gutting wouldn't it imagine that yeah like not good anyway talking about new strings I today saw uh, just in fact a few minutes ago Daddario have just tweeted out a picture of some uh, mysterious prototype strings that are their new product for 2014 mm. um, they just did a load of new stuff I know they're doing even more new stuff I, I, I thought only Ball did something different they're trying to get people to beta tests like these strings some strings it? which brings me around to what we're going to be talking about eventually this evening um, is our kind of gear hopes and dreams for 2014 Poss- possible gear of the year 2014 well yeah I mean I thought we could just do a quick kind of overview of what we thought was good about last year and where we can go from that next and what you want to see from, from different manufacturers really um, so I mean, last year we talked about it a lot on the Gear of the Year podcast. Fender and Gibson came on great strides in everything that they were doing. Really, mm. where do you think they could go next? The big, you know, the big two. I think they've got a tough year this year. Definitely. I think so because, um, well, I mean, you, I mean, Gibson's 2014 catalogue is, is on our on our website now, sure. so you can see. And there's nothing, there's nothing too radical. This although it. for bases, I think there's a couple of. But there are some great stuff for bases. Some of the finishes that they've released are absolutely smashing. That that some of the finishes they've released in the SG base are incredible. They've done yeah. like the full on SG base has now got a. I don't know what they've called it. Maybe a. Uh, maybe like a natural chocolate or something like uh, that. Oh yeah, it's like a chocolate satin or yeah. chocolate stain. Yeah, well, or no, they like had a they had a, a satin available in this in the special series yeah. for the SG, which they still do. Only it now looks remarkable. It actually looks better than it did last year. But in their standard series, which is the full sort of nitrocellulose finish series, they've um, they've introduced the brown, and it, it we've got one in there now, and it looks absolutely brilliant. So. I mean, yeah, they've got a few things out, but I don't think they're rocking the boat. I actually think, because Gibson and Fender fired so much on all cylinders last year, they're almost going to... They need to wait now in order to run with those things. But also, I think a lot of other companies, I think people like... I'm waiting to see what happens with people like Ibanez. Yeah, 100%. This year, because I think Ibanez last year probably sort of... It took them a bit by surprise, Fender and Gibson doing as much as they did. Yeah. I think we're going to see them really nail it this year Definitely. I, I mean you know I'm sure we'll come on to it but I think 2014 is going to be the year for extended range I think it's going to go absolutely mental well we've already we we're already talking about the fact that there's probably going to be a nine string production model this year yeah, there's, yeah. I think I've been as a rumour to be doing a nine string yeah. production model we don't know anything for I certain d- I, although I can't imagine whether it's <sighs> the thing is for a guitarist I know on, on basses like the six and seven string they tend to go higher because you necessarily you probably wouldn't want to well, go much lower. You never go lower than a B. Because so you're just you're you like hear it. You're going to be like all have this. You know, it's going to be yeah. like elephant here, and it? it's going to yeah. be so low. <laughs> but then, I, I, but on a guitar, would you really want to go higher? So you can only well, necessarily go. Don't forget, Ibanez lower. released that thirty something fret, thirty one fret, thirty one fret guitar mm. last year, where you could get those ludicrously high notes. But I think the thing is with it, say for like a seven string or an eight string, you can still play like an E minor and like you know bar yeah. chord and E minor or do you know like basic like first and fifth and sort of chords because you can go lower but on a on a guitar you on, you wouldn't necessarily go do that higher so I don't know I, What's, what will a nine string be I mean are there, are there any examples of non-production nine strings well I mean it, I, I think the it only thing that, the only um, the only thing I've seen that's a nine string was another company did a six string but the E, B well, and doubled G up. Doubled were all up. doubled yeah, up yeah. I don't Which think that's the way cool. they'll no, go no case because you can get 11 string basses mm. yeah. and obviously Taylor did the eight string baritone which is the D yeah. and the D doubled on a but I mean I, the neck would just be so huge yeah but, so huge but on a nine string guitar it's probably only going to be as, as wide as like a six string bass and you know you can still pay those that's true that's true I think we'll see I think we'll see what's, what's going to happen it's funny there. though because I think you know initially when people played eight strings especially well, especially it was a lot of jazzers because they were like yeah lo- yep. loads of low extended range for like you know doing bass and chords and lead yeah 
and it's only recently that it's kind of gone into the realms of metalers and that or more progressive styles of music so I think they've kind of swayed the way that these guitars are going to be yeah. used well, it, yeah I mean it's certainly it feels to me like progressive styles of music are certainly within this city are, are really on the up at the moment and so I think yeah, I think extended Someone, range. Someone's going to just take the nine and run with it, like well, exactly. Tosin and Abassi did with the, the eight. With the and eight, exactly. And all it's going to take, and I think Ibanez will be the people to pick that up. Definitely. I really think they're going to nail this year. Well, I mean, I was watching a, a, a video with, talking about, you know, it was with the guys from Corn, and they were saying, you know, and they still play the same seven strings. They still take the, the K, same... The K7. Yes, K7s. and, and uh, Fieldy still plays the K5. Yeah. And they were like... Apart, from, I think the the universe, the Steve Vai was probably one of the first production ones. Yeah. But I think their style of music brought that into the mainstream. Oh, for definitely. them to definitely do a cheaper one, and then I think people like Tosh and Vassi and stuff like that have bought the range, and Sugar have bought the range to come down and do cheaper eight strings and you see in check to do some for a few hundred quid. Mm, so right. I definitely think Ibanez will go well if we can do a nine string. Yeah. And I, I think you'll see a really expensive one, but I reckon by the end of the year, I think you'll definitely see a cheap one. I think I Ibanez are going to fill up quid. their catalogue with eight strings because if you look at sort of um, uh, uh, the sort of buying um, things that people are doing at the moment on eight strings, we're selling, um, we're getting through a lot of the Schecter eight strings because yeah. yeah. they're just more affordable than yeah. the Ibanez ones. Oh, I don't think Ibanez will want that. No, I think, I think they'll, they'll they'll jump on that definitely. Definitely. Just jumping back to Fender and Gibson, mm-hmm. um, I I do think there's still things that they can do. That you know, they obviously had a huge year last year. I think what they've what they've done is this. By the looks of it, you know, looking at the catalogue and that, they've, they've streamlined what they did did last yep. year. Brought out some new colours and kind of gone. I think there's still a few impressive bits. Obviously, you know, like you're saying, they've they've streamlined it and they've. Um, they've kind of taken away some of the tribute series and things like that and just solidified that range a bit which I think really needed doing Yeah. but also the new models they've introduced like the Melody Maker I think it's going to be a huge hit when people get their hands on it um, we've got so what's the Melody moment. Maker? so it's two P90s with a wraparound bridge but on a, like a carved top slightly yeah. thinner Les Paul so oh do you right. remember back in the day like the Gibson Goddess and Vixens and stuff yeah. like that yeah Kind of looks like one of those, but with two P90. It's almost like the oh, um, last year they did the Les Paul Custom Light, which was a Les Paul Custom, but about half the thickness. Yeah. Um, which were like ten nine nine. But this, I mean, this year you've got LPJs have been upgraded. They do, they say do an LPJ and then they do an LPJM, which is the same with the mini tunes, and they do That's the SGJ right. and the SGJ. Yeah, those mini tunes. But then they really brought in new play. studios, and I think it's about time they did something different with a with a studio because it's you know it's been the same guitar pretty much. Definitely. I've seen a couple of things. So you've got um, Studio and Studio Pro, and then the Futura um, Studios, which have got the mini e tunes as well. Three different types of standard traditionals, classics. And brought back the classics. I it's mean, just, I it's think that's just great. a really good range. Gibson are just I, by by focusing on the big two. They've. Um, mm. I think at the beginning of last year or last year we kind of saw Gibson trying to slim things down a little bit in terms of the amount of models, and they made a kind of slight misstep. I think last year with offering so many of those tributes, whereas now they've stripped that back and they've gone no. back to studio standards classic traditional which are terms that people they kind of know what they're getting from that I didn't necessarily know what I was getting from all of the different tribute ranges yeah. and I think this is a much <coughs> better indicator of what they're actually yeah. actually doing now what what about on the Fender side of things what well we, what I we mean think? actually get to, very quickly on, uh, on on Gibson on bass to the at the very end of 2013 they brought out their first ever five string oh yeah on, with, the, with the EB which was totally not their territory. No, it's so, not. And it's just, not Gibson at all. I just wonder if they'll they'll kind of maximise on that. I wonder if we'll see a little bit. It, of is that. there going to be a six string EB? That would be remarkable. Because there's a five, why there not? A five Jump string on the there. extended range. There are extended range players out there who want a more classic look, and I think things like the Tosin Abassi Ibanez are a great example of of that. I mean, so, know, something really so, expensive. Well, yeah, but, but but still like a classic looking extended range instrument is cool. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, anyway, sorry. what Fender going to do to top? Which oh, a year that I think is uh, one of their best years. Yeah. In, in for, I said this to someone today. Actually, <coughs> I, I put a blog up on the site about um, just summing up our uh, gear of the year, our top eight guitars or, or guitar bits, as it were. Um, and someone I know commented on it and just said, "I can't believe all this stuff came out this year." And I just said, "Yeah, in the ten you know plus years I've been working here." 
I think this has been actually the best year for yeah. guitars. It's, it's we're fr- certainly not going to have at the end of next year. We're not going to have an as easy a job. You never know. Well, you never know. Well, that's yeah, the that's thing. True, These companies have still got surprises. It's fu- it's funny, really, because I mean, right. even when I started working here, you know, if someone came in and bought a Fender, they were probably just going to buy a Mexican standard. Yeah. Really, or an American standard, and the same for sort of Gibson. But now, I mean, I can't remember the last time I sold just a plain standard Mexican know, strap because you've got classic players. Um, then you've got all the pawn shop series, and I, I think the thing, I think what we'll see from Fender, in a way, I hope they slim down some of the the standard range and just bring out a lot more of the kind of the pawn shop range and more FSR I stuff because that's that FSR stuff is we sell through that so quickly because it will suddenly. You know, we'll go. Oh, look at these seventy twos we did, like in the Vegas Gold and stuff like that, and they just went instantly. I think there's that's, more stuff like that, more limited stuff. Yeah, I think that's how Fender can top last year. Is just keep doing what they're doing. You know, keep on, on FSR. Uh, try and you know make as many Squire vintage modified base sixes as possible because we've got people queuing out the door for them. Base yeah. sevens, base no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and then yeah, do a load of FSR stuff. You know how cool are those Blues Juniors in different colours with different speakers? Yeah. Like you say, how cool was all that stuff in Vegas gold? Yeah, um, but the, but the, if that was in the catalogue the whole time, you chunk you would just kind of be like oh yeah and I think that's the thing and I think you know I think for a long time that's where it, companies like Ibanez always fell down because they would constantly go oh yeah we do this and like this finish and then they'll discontinue it and they'll bring out another one but the models always look so similar and there was never anything kind of too exclusive yeah I, th- I definitely think like smaller runs exclusive runs that's what people limited want. editions gives people that more uh, you know that individual definitely thing to their guitar. if I could have had one of those um, metallic ocean turquoise 72 Telecaster Deluxes Man, I would have been so happy. <laughs> so happy. A ridiculous guitar. So, was, and Fender and Gibson just kind of need to build on what they did last year. Ibanez, hopefully, are just going to pull something out of left field. Yeah. Go for the nine string. Go for maybe some new indoor C's, I think, is the other thing. They started <laughs> it last thing, year. Isn't it? Yeah. They started it. We talked about, you know, Tozen Abassi, um, the guy from Yumi at Six. Yeah, that's um, right. They had some really interesting ones. It'd be cool if year. they kind of built on that, There's really. Some more. Yeah, that would be good. Um, and that kind of leads me on to my next point. Again, we spoke about it in Gear of the Year. I think next year, or this year, 2014, the future, uh-huh. is going to be about more diverse signature models. I think so, too. I think you're absolutely right. The signature models are on the up. I actually think we might see some of this a little more from the amp side of things as well. I would like to, anyway, see a little bit more of this. Like things like the Jim Root, the orange yep. brought out. And I think mm. orange seems to be quite on the money with that sort of Definitely. stuff. Definitely. But, so yeah. we think signature amps who I mean who who would you point out really who could have a signature amp Mike Dern I think Mike Dern's an obvious one for me like he uses those super basemen at the right. moment uh, so so does everyone yeah. in, in sort of American punk at the moment like if Matt Freeman uses them now as well but that'd basically. be cool wouldn't it like Mike Dern's signature yeah, super basemen that just like, runs a little hotter because yeah. you, know, you don't I mean, need that clean the one that I thought, I'm, on the one I'm surprised they didn't that hasn't come out um, but then again I think they would probably do it a limited run like they've done before would be a Paul Gilbert signature Marshall because he moved from Laney to Marshall didn't they did they do one did they do a limited no because you, you had the Joe Satriani and the oh, Yves yeah. Mounstein which That's was really was limited because yeah. the Yves Mounstein was awesome because they had like a delay a reverb and a noise gate which was all foot switchable on it and they just like they went straight away then they did the Joe Satriani so obviously they still do the Kerry King which mm. is in their catalogue I think yeah, next true. year I was going to come on to this Big actually like I that. think Marshall have got to make this a key year because a lot of the kind of stuff they're doing at the moment is kind of similar to stuff that they've been doing for a while well, they're just doing like a lot of ham like we were talking uh, a few weeks ago before Christmas about all the ham wide stuff it's like two and a half grand it's going to be amazing but it's still two and a half grand and I think you know they could definitely I think a new series that kind of um, consolidates things that they've been doing with JVM and Maybe yeah. Again, we talked about it before Christmas, like something that's maybe not as feature packed as yeah, I mean, someone could JVM, but you, not like hand wired. Remember yeah. how good the class five was? Yes. What if there was a class fifteen? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Exactly, just something to compete with the Blues Junior. Class, the Blues class Junior 50. is we, we sell the Blues Junior more than anything else. Mm. You know, class fifty greatest. head. Yeah. Yeah. Anything like that. Simple. It's one channel and it sounds awesome. Well, and it's what Marshall are all about, which is that that just that original really awesome rock sound the Definitely. funny thing is is you know they did like the one watt offset custom stack which looked like the early ones with the mm. offset center panel and you really like, nice man do jo- those Joe Bonamassa had one in his yeah, room yeah. When we do, went to do one scene. of those do a limited run of those you know 
amazing but just do slight because I think the one what stuff was cool it was like here's the five best dance we've done one from each decade look how awesome they are but people were like yeah they're only one watt yeah. and then they went oh they were doing another slash and it's like wicked yeah 20 watts 30 watts it's like yeah 5 watts it's like it's good but they, for- they sort of know what people want they just haven't quite got there because you know no, they did like remember they did the Marshall Hayes amps which were like 15 watts failed but then they had these effects but it was like a hybrid and it was just like they still haven't quite got there I really 15 watts is what people I want. really loved DSL 50s like I've talked about it so many times but if they would just do now a really good something similar to a DSL 50 but like one channel mm. around that same price point like five to six five six hundred quid for the head well I still get a lot of people um, you know inquiries people selling or wanting to buy the older JCMs with the, just the single channel the master volume ones oh yeah because they sound awesome yeah you know because they're just single channel like a plexi but they're more hot rodded so they're just like yeah they're ace what about orange do you think orange are going to get on it anymore this year I don't know I think it, it was funny really they they released the the crush didn't they just before Christmas Cru- crush pros and then you would have thought maybe I'm surprised they didn't say it for now maybe they wanted to get it out for Christmas but I reckon they're going to follow on from that I think you're going to see a lot more, more stuff. Stuff. Yeah. Some more actually stuff. funny enough on Facebook I've started following this group um that these people just love all like all, all the old sun amps and oh, stuff yeah. like that. I and love a lot, sun. But a lot of that sun stuff was solid state, and they, yeah. these all these guys are into like real heavy like stoner doom rock and stuff. Like that. But they're playing like oranges and matte amps and stuff like that. And that's what and a lot so much of that older stuff as well. That's like sun that are all solid state for that super high gain, but I'm, you still um, get clarity of your guitar sound. I would really, really like Orange to do. I know exactly what you're going to say. Transistor front end, uh-huh. valve output stage, oh, like the thought, like the it? Music Man heads of oh, the seventies. Yeah. yeah, that would sound that amazing. Was a great idea. The, I mean, those are kind of they're voiced a bit sort of fendery, like sparkly. But if you could work out a way of doing that, just That's an orange, yeah, that front end because the Crush Pros they do sound really good. But mm. if you give that a bit of valve oomph, like behind it, yeah. and yeah. you know make it 30 watts 30 watt heads I think that would sound amazing I am. Yeah. I really want to see them as they've released the Pro I really want to see some transistor bass amps because yeah. let's face it that works unlike guitar stuff well with the guitar stuff I know, I know theirs does but you know but, but for bass you can make really good I'm surprised good they, haven't done, they haven't done like a transistor yeah, bass head do a terror. transistor bass head come on I'd, I'd love that I'd love to have a reliable bass head you know from Orange not that their stuff is unreliable but you know that, that you know that's not gonna I'm not gonna have to well I think the thing is bass players don't want to worry about vowels now because no, they haven't had to for yeah. so long well preamps just <coughs> become so so popular and you know when do you have to replace a 12 AX7 definitely never. Yeah. Mm. Matt Knight Let's talk about the future world of tomorrow when it comes to guitar pedals. Welcome to the world of tomorrow. What um what do you want to see in 2014? What I mean it's I know it's hard to imagine, but there is a pedal out there that you haven't got yet. Well, it's funny actually because I, I, I on on, a, on rather than thinking about things that haven't even flinch that, that it's just not actually existed. Yeah. Um, Zvex last in summer now announced four new pedals. No. Yeah. I think I have six new pedals, none of which have surfaced yet. Really? But yeah. So I'm hoping at NAM this year they'll actually have the final ones ready to go. So they're doing a, they're doing one called the number two, which is the second channel from the um, Super Duper Two in One. So oh, like yeah. a really good, super good clean boost, like cool. the best clean boost. They're doing um, the fuzz from the Mastertron in a two control thing for bass. I think. Oh my god! Um, they're doing another one called I think it's called like the Snow White, which is a clean to white noise fader, which just fades oh, I've your. I've heard cl- about that. Yeah, which is uh, just oh, weird. that's so awesome. But yeah, that's it cleans so your guitar signal into white noise. Oh. Um, and then they've that's done. That's not usable at that's all. That's so usable. <laughs> Why? That's perfect for like links and. Yeah, but then they've links. also done because you know they've had the Uwa, the Seek Trem, and all that, which is their sequencer tremolo. They've yeah. done the Super Seek Trem, so they're. They've done a wah, a trem, and a ring modulator. So 16 step sequences that are all MIDI controlled. And um, there's a Fuzz Factory 7 as well. So seven knob Fuzz Factory. That would be amazing. Which is really limited. What are the extra knobs going to do? More. No, who knows? Yeah. So you don't even really know what the five knobs do, really. Who you know? knows? So these pedals might come out this year. Yeah, well, they were, they, there's videos, albeit not very long ones, of people, you know. 
showing these uh, Zvex showing them off at some of them. So I remember talking to our purchaser Luke, and he was like, "Yeah, cool." You know, we spoke to Zvex; they're going to let us order them as soon as they come in. But not heard anything since. No. Um, but in terms of companies that are going to come out with stuff that's going to be sort of different, um, I think Electroharmonics are on it. Yeah, do you? I yeah. think they're coming back in a big way. So, because they, they've not only, I think they've cornered not only the cheaper end of the market. I think they've got some stuff lined up for, like. The, when they first announced the Slammy, which came out just before Christmas, which is their like whammy pedal, basically, mm. I just dismissed it straight away. I was like, nah, it's just another whammy clone. But when I actually plugged it in, didn't realise it's polyphonic. What? So, I mean, obviously, you know, the whammy DT had been out for a while, but these ones, it's a little simpler to use, and there's no moving parts. It's, I just it, think they're I, really I've cool. I've not looked into the Slammy at all. So, it's a basically, it's... It's got like a gyro inside, is yeah. that right? It, it's not actually a gyro, but it knows the position. Yeah, of sort of like, where your, the pedal like is. you've got your phone. So it's not, like that. it's not attached to anything. It's just literally is the kind of pedal and it rocks around on yeah. the floor. You can buy a little cradle for it if you want to put it on a pedal board. Right. But okay. yeah, these ones. So this is this part of this next step series they've been doing. And I think a lot of people have gone, oh, I'm not really that bothered. But I think that technology is going to start. Definitely. They're going to start using it in other things. Definitely. What. Um, can you? Is there any switchable modes or anything on it? Is there? Yeah. So on the on the slammy, you've got everything from um, you've got all the all the main ones. I think it's like second, fourth, fifth, seventh octave up, two octaves up, and then the same again down as well. Okay. Which you can set, but you can also because you can do that, you can sort of almost set it, rock it in half the position, and then recalibrate the pedal so you can leave it Just stuck. Do like in weird. Yeah. Um, oh, that's wicked. And then they've done things like the Nano Big Muff and stuff like that. And yeah. I think the, 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 the soul, Nano the range. Soul Food, which is out this week hopefully yeah we'll get really some this weird week. I, was, I was just on the Electromonics Facebook now like oh yeah it's a new new overdrive yeah someone messaged us the other day and asked if we'd tried it yet no I mean they're, they're not here no, so, know, right. um, but they will be I but, but uh, I think I think that sort of stuff is I think they're, they're going down that route of maybe more classic classic effects done in a slightly more modern way because obviously they did the East River Drive which is a little bit like a tube screamer and stuff like that they so. also seem to have their eye on I mean again that that's kind of a indicative of this really they seem to have their eye on what other companies are doing mm. and instead of just going oh here's a new big muff here's uh, oh, a, a slightly different version of the uh, the chorus or whatever yeah um, they're you know they're doing like the soul food which is a <coughs> con centaur copy yeah. in an electroharmonics box the most expensive overdrive pedal you can buy and I actually found out that, that you, you can still occasionally buy new ones the guy really? still makes occasionally new ones but he's I'd imagine he buys and puts them on eBay because they go for a thousand yeah, yeah, pounds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I think that's really good for electronics because for a long time they've just gone, okay, we had this big bank of pedals in the seventies. Oh, here's another one that we haven't reissued yet. Right, let's just do yeah, that. Yeah, or here's one you forgot about because like, for ages what I've been trying to do and there's nowhere. And I might actually contact them. Go, there's nowhere you can look at their entire back history. Right, of no everything one's ever catalogued it. No, oh, that sounds like a job for you. I know. I might email them because so I, do it. Because you know there was the the Roland one, and they put all the the Roland yeah. Product, yeah, it was going around on Facebook. Now I was like, every so often I'm on like eBay or whatever, and a random electroharmonics pedal will come up. I'm like, I've never heard of that. And then suddenly they'll do a reissue of it. Like when the random tone generator came out, I was like, that's really weird. And they went, I oh, know we made that in like '76. It's like, yeah, and I think now they're kind of gone. Actually, maybe we should. We should design something yeah. new. We and it, it's working out new. really well. I think like East River Drive and stuff like that, they just sound really good. Well, I think it's Mike Matthew's son. I think he's one of the designers now because right. he helped redesign the eight-step program. Oh, really? Yeah, so I think they're, I think they'll definitely be a company to watch and I think Strymon are probably going to pull something I was out gonna, I was going to say, let's just quickly talk about Strymon. What can Strymon do next year that they are not doing already that is going to blow your mind in the same way as the Strymon Big Sky? Uh, is it- get less drunk so they can make the pedals <laughs> and actually send them over to the UK <laughs> no that's, they don't need to do that um, I it's funny because so you know they did the Mobius modulation timeline delay reverb and then they did and then you thought oh they did a flint well that's that's another reverb and a tremolo they sort of, but then that pedal's awesome in its own way yep. and they sort of do a compressor <laughs> and then you're like oh, what, did they do a compressor what? yeah the OB1 it's a compressor and a boost but yeah. what haven't they done they haven't done a drive so, but then is it their thing? I'm saying they really like digital stuff, so they really I, like all that. Di- I don't think a drive is their thing, and I don't think uh, a distortion is their thing. What I think is their thing is a fuzz that oh, yeah. is mental. 
Like <laughs> some sort of absolutely just, ridiculous fuzz. Well, yeah, like you know, you could see, back in the day, you'd see like those Devi Ever things that have got the joystick on and stuff like that. I can imagine Strymon doing something like or, that, or or doing like possibly the best multi effects you've ever seen. Well, I mean, that's where they'll go. They'll maybe they'll do something to rival so, like a something, G- something like a G, like a G system. system. Yeah, if it was the same sort of money, but it had like all of those pedals built in. I and and. Just, I love the way they just lay things out so simply on all their pedals. It's ne- as n- they're never difficult to program. No. I reckon if they did a wicked multi effects, that I reckon that'd be good. I'd definitely buy one. I uh, I'm going to email them. Have, now. have we covered all bases? Well, I mean, well, we haven't. We I'm have, just we, what about Boss? I think Boss might uh, put out. Some, well, I'd, well, I'd be Joe, interested to see. We um, we're going to be recording a podcast with Jamie Dor, our, yeah. our, oh, our friend oh, of Boss, um, which is going to be out. Um, not it won't be the one out next week. It'll be the one after, um, and he is going to exclusively reveal all of the new Boss products, oh. I believe. So will he tell me beforehand? He won't tell you beforehand. Oh. Um, or he will because we'll record no, it won't. beforehand. But then it we will did go spend out. we did spend hours trying to get him to tell us. Yes, the other and, day. and he hasn't. And he hasn't. Um, but that's really exciting because I think now that Jamie's on board doing some of the design and you know he's, he's got more my involved. Dream job. He's like, I, mean, I love working here, but I mean, to design boss pedals. He, I think he's going to have a lot of good input into the things that they're bringing out, and uh, I, th- I think it's going to be an exciting year for Boss. I can feel yeah, it I already. So like at, at the beginning of last year, did we care about Boss? Did you guys care about Boss? No, I, I much. must admit it has only been. The, but then I looked at my pedal board the other day and my other various collections of pedals lying around. I was like, I've got a lot of Boss pedals, and they're all really good. Yeah, but the, even. I think because we started talking about them a bit more and because we, as a brand, they want to seem to get involved, you know, with, with us guys and with the kind of pedal community almost, things like the metal stack, we've gone back and reevaluated and gone, that is a really good sounding pedal. Yeah. Mm. Whereas before we could have kind of gone, oh yeah, just get a, I don't know, just get another brand's drive pedal. Um, whereas now, we're kind of thinking about it in a different way and I think that is what Boss have managed to do over the course of a year yeah. um, and what they're definitely going to continue to well, do I mean, into next we year. It, we were saying it earlier that they've kind of... I think I think maybe a year ago I was thinking of Boss as kind of the standard version of everything and then everyone else as like more elaborate, more awesome, more yeah. inventive versions. But it's not the case at all. Actually, Boss are the quintessential version of those pedals. So things like the DS1 is the quintessential distortion yeah. effect things like the power stack we think they haven't changed the DS1 they've only mo- very minorly changed the DS1 since its release like nearly th- 30 years ago no more than 30, more than 30 years, 30 years ago. ago now actually yeah yeah. I mean that's that, that's crazy yeah yeah. they're brilliant and I, I'm looking forward to that podcast a I'm lot I'm excited to see what they've what they've got in store for this year and if they've got anything awesome in store for, for bass guitarists because I think bass pedals are on that up at well, the moment. I mean the funny thing with, with bosses is last year for me it was the first truly in a way what felt like a different compact pedal when they did the TE2 yeah because I went oh it's just it's just a delay really but actually when I really went into it I was like this is so much more and that multi-dimensional processing that MDP that they I think that is I think that's going to feature a lot more in certain effects and definitely yeah. definitely I'm excited yeah I'm excited for Boss this year I want to see where they take it I also think because of the way people view them as kind of the standard they they're starting to realise that and they're thinking we need to work harder at the next things that we do and we need to make these better and we need to make people <coughs> shout out about Boss who previously would not have done so yeah I'm excited for that yeah Anything else that you want to add? What are you looking forward to next year? If not, we'll do some staff picks. Um, Pedals in general. Just, pe- <laughs> <laughs> just all the news. Well, I mean, to be honest, Nam is one of my favourite times of the year. Yeah. Um, we'll talk. We'll talk about that Nam a bit at the end um, because we've got some podcast plans for that. But I'm. Uh, yeah. I, I'm. I'm interested to see kind of what's what's going to happen with bases this year. I think 2014 could be a really cool year. I'm. I'm really excited to see what 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 Nam has to offer. I would like to see Yamaha maximise <laughs> on. The, what are you more, laughing? More, I don't know. I was going to. Always Yamaha. Yeah, was but interesting. What but, we haven't talked about. Breaking uh-huh. news in the last couple of weeks. Oh, of course. Well, uh, yeah. Yam- Yamaha, Yamaha have bought, bought line, line six. six. Oh yeah, of course. I forgot yeah. about that. So it's sort of like. Silently announced. 
Well, just, it was weird. Yeah. Just when everyone it. started closing down for yeah. Christmas, and then they were like, Line oh, yeah. 6 have got awesome. This year, obviously, because we've had like the M5s in there. I know they've been around for a yeah. bit, yeah. but I think they're. I think I, what I would like to see out of that merger is Pacificas with Variax technology. Because I love Pacificas. Yeah. I like Variax. I don't necessarily think that either of them have got the recognition they deserve in yeah. the past few years. I and I think if you combine them together, you're going to make. If they can make. A Variax in a Pacifica body for 500 quid. That's what I was about to say. I mean, uh, yeah. I'd buy one. Yeah, I'd definitely buy one. I oh. really like them. I, I, but on the base front, I'd like to see Yamaha kind of bounce back from, from what happened with the BB sort of last year, where they sort of relaunched it as this big this big thing to like rival Fender. And uh, and it didn't really, it didn't really take didn't off. didn't take off as but much. As, what about a reissue or the relaunch of the Variax base? Oh, that would be great. That would be really good, but people would like it if it was done really well. Bass players love all that techie stuff. It would it would be a great six, idea. Six to seven hundred quid, BB with Variax Electronics. Oh my god, that's better. Suppose, better five suppose, string. I suppose that's one of the things now is that they have. I can imagine that. that it was like when everything that Roland started doing from the keyboard range had the D-beam on it yeah. because they bought the D-beam technology off another company yeah. so they were like well we've bought it now because I think they bought, took over another company and they went oh well we might as well just stick it in everything now we own the technology and I think Line sit like you know Yamaha are going to go wow well we we own all this Variax technology so let's just and then they also own all of the modellers and stuff like I, one thing I really liked on the THRs the amps was the distortion sounds like the preamp sounds yeah. I thought were really good I thought the effects um, uh, were, were nice um, but I didn't think they were standard you know they weren't phenomenal well, whereas imagine what a THR with some of the modelling yeah, the Line I mean, 6 effects modeller technology and it's, be like. it's funny really because 2013 since we sort of doing this podcast we've sort of gone back and I think because we've had a chance to talk about gear we've gone and re-evaluated all the gear that we necessarily wouldn't have thought about because you know let's face it a new product doesn't necessarily come out every day that we can talk Definitely. about so we've gone back and gone and you know in terms of like you're saying like say the line 6 amp range they haven't really done anything new for a while but Yamaha have kind of released tech charts which were good but they weren't like a massive success so now that the two companies are together you think well you know yeah. who knows what you might and they could build oh, they can just work more on that DT range I can like They've got a similar vibe, I think, the THRs and those DTs. Yeah. I'd love to see, like, a DT practice amp. Because that's what I need for my house. I need a really good sounding, not overly complicated, small amp. And I've thought about getting a DT25, but, like, a DT10 would be incredible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. And if idea. Yamaha can inspire them to do that and start thinking about, like, home use stuff as yeah. well, I think that will be awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Very quickly, before we leave this and go on to staff picks, on the subject of, I forgot to mention it when we were talking about signature amps, at the end of 2012, so this, 2013, has been the first full year, Billy Sheen moved from, uh, yeah, I have to, Billy Sheen moved from Ampeg to Hotkey as his amp. Oh yeah. Now, he had a signature Ampeg. He has a signature Yamaha Attitude guitar. He has a signature EBS drive pedal. He doesn't have a signature amp head at the moment. At the moment, he's just using the LH1000 for his low end and the HA5500 uh, for for his for his high end. And he's using the AK410s and AK15s. So I'd be really interested to see if he brings out because he has to use two different heads at the moment to get. The, right, the, his tone. His tone. So yeah, he's going to go does. for a two-channel combination so of the I, pair. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if we're going to see a um, something come out because actually, I'm not sure that he's a hundred percent on the. I don't know this, but I don't know if he's a hundred percent on them because I saw his band Winery Dogs doing a live show. Admittedly, it was a studio show, so you know, I, I know that's your setup can change for that. But he was using a super basement. Hmm. And that is, bear in mind, he's a heart key indoor C. Interesting. I thought that was a bit. Uh, but who knows? He might. It. He might be. It might have just been what was there or yeah, something like exactly. that. You know, who could, knows? It could well have been. But very but, um, interesting, nonetheless. Very I'll, interesting. I would so love like to see to a Billy see. Sheen signature head because yeah. I would laugh because you have to buy it. I would. I would definitely. And you're, you're definitely so skinny. I would just laugh <laughs> <laughs> when when we go out for our lunch and you're eating one pound um, Scotch eggs because you've had to buy the Billy Sheehan head oh, that's, that, that is what's going to happen I will laugh I mean in a few days I may well be the owner of a seven string bass 
anyone who sees me on Twitter will see the very one. Gents, we've been speculating on the gear of next year, but let's not forget, this is a quiet time because we're very much the pre-NAM uh, exhibition and not a lot of new stuff's come out. But let's talk about some stuff that is in stock. Let's do some staff picks. Matt Knight, what have you been playing this week? What should people try out? Oh, well, talking of companies that are, you know, this year, I would say, have done, well, a lot. Um, uh, Moore. Yes. Um, which is, I kind of didn't really mention it that much in in what we were just talking about, mainly because I don't really know what they're going to do yet next year, but a lot of the things they've been doing are copies but I, I do think next year or this year should I say they, I think they might start maybe they'll delve into more original things or not Definitely. but um, one of the things that's out now which is awesome for the money it's, it's actually so good it's unbelievable it's, <laughs> um, it's the it's the the Moore uh, Mod Factory all in one micro modulation pedal this is so absolutely I'm gonna, I had remarkable. to get the list out of all the effects that are on it but you've got the following effects bear in mind so, this is the same size as their standard pedals yeah bear in mind this is no this is different as big as your finger yeah so they you can choose between chorus flanger phaser envelope phaser tremolo stutter vibrato univibe auto wire touch wire envelope ring modulator effects all with a full 32 bit DSP processor so full high quality digital processor um, for fifty nine pounds ninety nine, <laughs> <laughs> and I. The thing is, I bought one of the phasers because the phaser was brilliant. It was I really needed like a little phaser for my tiny pedal board, and I was like, I just really needed one, and that was it. Just sounded better than a lot of the other ones that were. I mean, yeah, there's some cool boutique pedals out there that are like three hundred quid, but for an effect that I don't use that mm. often, no. exactly. I am a hundred percent buying one of these. It's like, you know. The only thing is, obviously, you can't change between the different. You can't, you no, can't go up and down. But then, okay. all right, so you only need an auto wire for one song and a vibrato for another. What well, is, is it? The large knob in the middle that changes. Yeah, the and effect. then you've got three oh, controls. So how is, um, how is that different from an M5, for example? Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. You I mean, mean you just don't have as much on it. Um, but an I mean, M5 you still takes got, up loads of room on my board. Yeah, but st I mean, it's still the best one. No, it's it still is. the yeah. best one. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing is, is yeah, it's just nine volt. It doesn't take much space. And like I say, you know, all oh, right, cool. I need a, yeah, I need a Univibe setting for one. Like you say, you've got an M5 just mainly for a, a Univibe yeah, setting. Yeah, that's yeah. So that's if you're not going to use it for anything else, and you just have that on your, your pedal board, then why yeah. not? Absolutely, wicked. Joe Branton, what yes. have you been playing? What should people check out? I'm gonna get it. Oh, he stood up. What's going on? I'm sitting with it. Oh. It's it. It looks like it's made out of real wood. All right, it is. It's like a proper coffee table uh, base. Um, because I'm I'm so very uh, obsessed with uh, extended range at the moment, and and of course I'm I'm hoping for loads of new stuff to come out this year. But I thought just a really solid example of a great six string bass. Um, I would pick up the uh, the Ibanez SR 1206, um, which is their they're kind of their 1200 series six string bass so it's um it's like an avanco top on a mahogany body and you've got a jatoba binger five piece neck gold hardware nordstrand pickups and the nordstrand pickups sound absolutely remarkable the the, the pickups themselves and the preamp that they supply with them are, are just the best pickups you can get at the moment they're so cutting they're so like exactly it's, it's my problem with the bartolinis that they put in their their 500 series yep. of these that, that they're just a little bit a little bit depthless a little bit flat sounding they're a bit they're quite mellow yeah exactly these are absolutely brilliant really kind of aggressive that you actually can do you know lots and lots of different sounds you can do everything from kind of a, a cutting rock tone to you know a really super clean sort of funky slap tone it has an active passive Perfect. Switch on it, so so I you just, turn the active off I just straight turn away. The active off straight away. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it still sounds brilliant. And uh, yeah, it's just an absolutely wicked bit of gear for less than a grand, for just under a grand. I think a six string bass. It's it's that what looks I, this boutique. It's what Ibanez do very well, isn't it? They make basses that look like they should cost two and a half grand, um, for a grand. Yeah, exactly. I oh, love all oh, the fancy um, wood names. Monorail Bridge as well. Um, which I think is a really cool thing you don't really see on anything that's not boutique at the moment so each string is dealt with independently which is really awesome the wood names were like Avankov Jatoba Babinga Babinga Jatoba Jatoba's yeah. good 
It's really awesome. And Venge, which everyone mispronounces Wenge. as Wenge. Yeah. Is it Venge? Venge. It's the African. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a football manager. Arsene Venge. <laughs> Arsene Venge. Um, um, my star pick this week. Are you going to be quiet or not? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, my star pick this week is basically the complete opposite of everything you've just said. <laughs> um, I. Is it a one string bass? No. Made out of plywood? No, it's nearly that. Um, it's certainly not made out of plywood. Um, I walked into the bass department earlier to hear you um, playing about a million notes uh, all at once on a ridiculous six string bass. And hanging up there was the Fender Custom Shop Limited Edition Gold Top. Dusty Hill Precision Bass oh, Relic. Yeah. So, for those not in so the know, dusty. and I don't know why you wouldn't be in the know, Dusty Hill is the bass player in ZZ Top. Um, obviously, he's playing, I guess it's quite minimal. It's it's just good rock and roll bass playing. Yeah. Um, Fender have done him a custom shop signature for a little while, uh, which is based on like a sort of 50s, early 50s, like single. 51, sing- yeah. F- yeah, 51 with that kind of single pickup, the non split P bass pickup in there, just slab body. Um, two saddle bridge really oh. chunky neck um, it's as basic as you could get like the back of the bass isn't even really finished well, the great like thing is, finish. well the great thing is it's basically a Les Paul gold top because it's like a mahogany it's mahogany it's a mahogany body isn't it is I it? think so yeah it's Wait, a mahogany look, body really? with a maple top so it's basically like a Les Paul but in a in a, in a 51 oh, P bass just well of apparently a it's much is it, or, is it ma- or is it all maple it's lightweight akume is the go. body cool but it, yeah I mean it's got that kind of dark sort of mahogany look to it yeah. um, and then yeah this this they don't normally have this but this limited edition um, has got a gold top with like white edge binding it looks amazing it looks absolutely brilliant um, there's only the 50, aging on it is uh, yeah I mean it's Fender Custom Shop so you know that the aging is going to be done well 50 worldwide whoever buys that they probably won't see anyone else with one. I can't believe we've got Whoever one. buys it is an absolute legend. I know. How many are there in the UK? Um, not a lot. I would 10, I would 20, say... Four? Le- def- oh, there's got to be less than five, I would have thought. Yeah. I couldn't guarantee it, but I mean, I've got to say... I think it's probably about four or five. But yeah, I mean, if you're into <laughs> kind of simplicity of bass, and if you just want a good rock and roll bass amazing it's quite a lot of money but then it's Fender Custom Shop it's super limited you'll never see another one and it's well different though it's It's really different it's really different it's not it's not like a normal it's not like a like a Custom Shop 64 or something in a different colour with a different neck profile it's like that is really different. I just love the idea that somewhere out there there's a ZZ Top covers band who will probably buy it and the dude who buys it will have the huge beard and put the sunglasses and hat on. Do you and think... It will find its perfect home. I just want <laughs> someone to buy that bass so much. ZZ Top... If they're ZZ Top covers bands, do you reckon they all have to go out there and buy like... Except for the drummer. The fake beards. Apart from Frank Beard. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, so there we go. That's our staff picks. There's no questions this week. I did. Um, I put something out to Twitter saying what would people like to see, and everyone's kind of. We kind of covered it all already. Um, what people would like to see in the new year. Um, I think there's there's going to be a lot of stuff. I'm yeah, looking forward to this year. No, it's going to be amazing. Oh, can we can we talk about what's coming up? Yeah, definitely. Um, we're almost up at time, so I guess we should start wrapping up. But let's talk about a couple of things that we've got coming up on the podcast in the next few weeks. So next week, um, which is the seventh, we're just going to do a normal podcast. We'll have Jay Cross back on side. We can catch up with what he's doing. So sorry about that. Yeah, sorry guys. Yeah. Um, we can catch up with what Jay's doing. I'm sure he's had a productive Christmas. And did, is, has he bought any guitars in the last couple of weeks? He normally every couple of weeks uh, buys something. No. He no, al- I don't know. I don't know actually. I, I think, think he almost so. bought something recently. I can't remember what it was. Was it a Mustang? Oh no, he no, did, he buy, did a buy that. Yeah, yeah. He just he's, got all the guitars. Yeah. Um, so next week we've got a full crew back. Um, after that. Uh, the podcast is coming out on Wednesday the, th- the 15th um, because that's when we're going to be speaking to Jamie Dore from Boss and we're yes. going to be talking about some super secret stuff that is completely embargoed until the 15th I'm really excited but it is going to come out uh, early in the morning so um, this will be the first place that you hear any details about the uh, the new Boss pedals exclusive indeed um, and then after that the week after that is Nam, um, but we're going to do a podcast. You're going to Nam. I am. I'm, I should say I'm going to Nam. It's Nam, by the way. I know. Nam. I like to call it Nam. Just I know. Just to annoy you, me. You don't like it. Um, so 
the, that week of the podcast, we're doing a pre-NAM show um, where we're going to be joined by uh, Rebecca Dirks from Tone Report, um, <laughs> who is going to talk about kind of what she wants to see at NAM and, and what she'll be doing at NAM, and we'll talk about. Have what, you guys got the Tone do. Report app? It's well good. It's very nice I indeed. Can get yeah. Updated on news like all the time. And then that week, um, every night from now, I'm going to be doing a little day report, um, just talking about what I've seen at the show and talking about the videos that we're putting up and making you guys super jealous, I hope, Matt. I might cry. <laughs> I'm going to cry. I can't believe you're going to Nam and the <coughs> rest year, of us Every aren't. year I say next year, but next year I will go. Only one member of the podcast crew is going to Nam. No, we'll all and go. And it's me, because we'll I'm, the, go, I'm the only one who knows we'll how to use the we'll recorder. And it'll be like the hangover. Oh, God. <laughs> um, on that note, I think we should wrap things up. Yeah. Thanks again for uh, for joining us. Um, 2014 is going to be good. Um, please do share the podcast with everyone you know. Mm. And also talk to us on Twitter and Facebook. I really want to encourage that this year is follow us on Twitter, chat to us about guitars. Um, well, I'm always more than happy to talk. Man, like, where can mm. people get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, well, you can get me on uh, on Twitter uh, at Matt underscore Nighty. That's Night with S I E on the end. And yeah, I really want to. I do, I like Twitter. It, I like people sending me pictures of their pedals and talking about pedals and leads and gut shots like, of pedals. Gut shots of pedals. Actually, talking about that, someone did actually send me some pictures of some insides of guitars that. I, that I really requested. Um, uh, no more about that another time. And uh, or you could email me at matt.knight k n i g h t at g a k dot co uk. Also another good way to get hold of me. Joe Branton, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, if you want to email me, you can get hold of me on joe dot at g a k dot co uk. Or um, much better is uh, is Twitter. You can find me on yosef underscore nine hundred. I'm massively, massively into extended range. Uh, so if you want to talk to me about either extended range or how good tone report is i will talk about those two things excellent and if you want to talk to us in general um i man the gak twitter which is at gak underscore co underscore uk um or you can talk to us on facebook facebook.com forward slash gak music you can email us podcast at gak.co.uk if you want to talk to me personally and please do i i'm i'm all right I'm alright, you know. I'm not as good as these two, but I'm alright. Mark underscore random. Um, thanks so much for joining us this week. Uh, it's been a, a bit of a subdued one. We're still recovering from 2013. I think it's a small introduction into the Yeah. yeah. Um, so please continue to listen to in, in 2014. We've got loads of stuff coming up. Um, thanks very much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Farewell. I thought you said Michael Bacon, no. which sounds like a glorious breakfast sandwich that I didn't have this morning. A Michael Bacon sandwich. Kevin Bacon sandwich.